Welcome to Lesson 4 in this study series on the book of Proverbs. As we continue our study of the parental speeches found in chapters 1 to 9, we now move to the second speech of the father. It is found in chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. We will skip over Wisdom's first speech found in chapter 1 and address it later together with her second speech located in chapter 8. Let me remind you that I cannot cover all the speeches in depth. While I would love to do so, the scope of this series is only to provide an extended introduction to the book of Proverbs. It is my goal to give you a brief outline, movement, and general content of the speeches, and hopefully the tools to begin your own personal study. In this process, I hope you fall in love with these speeches of Proverbs as I have. Let's turn to chapter 2 of Proverbs and begin our study of the father's second speech to his son. The most striking thing about this second speech is its structure. In fact, it's the most unique speech in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. Let's read the speech and then begin to break it down. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. For He guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong, and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Let me begin with some literary observations about this speech. First, the entire speech is written as one continuous sentence without a break. Second, though it is not easily seen in English, this speech is actually a 21-line poem that parallels the exact number of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Third, this poem, speech, breaks into six distinct, balanced stanzas of four lines, four lines, three, four lines, four lines, three. Additionally, the last verse of the third stanza, verse 11, and the first line of the fourth stanza, verse 12, create what is called a hinge verse. The two verses are connected together or hinged by a common theme and wording. The association of understanding and discretion, and again, saving and protecting, describe the son who obtains wisdom. This effectively connects the first half of the poem together with the second half. The fourth thing is this. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, begins verses 1, 5, and 9, which begin the first three stanzas of the poem. The Hebrew letter, Lamed, 
which begins the second half of the Hebrew alphabet, begins verses 12, 16, and 20, which make up the beginning of the last three stanzas of the poem. Fifth, the poem contains a conclusion or summary statement consisting of a promise and a warning in the last stanza of the poem, verses 20 to 22. Sixth, the theme of the Father's speech can be succinctly summed up as gaining wisdom equals right relationship with God, which in turn equals gaining wisdom. In other words, seeking and possessing wisdom enables us to have the right relationship with God. Wisdom helps us to make good decisions, to discern between right and wrong according to God's standard. Wisdom protects us and puts us on the right path, a path blessed by God. Pursuing either part of this formula enhances the son's success with the other. The two parts are thematically and intentionally partnered to create this circular principle in Proverbs. It is purposefully tied back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and forward to chapter 9, verse 10, to create a tightly constructed unit of chapters 1 to 9. Seventh, this kind of literary structure indicates an extremely creative purpose and intentionality. In fact, some scholars also suggest this carefully crafted poem introduces themes that are later developed in chapters 3 through 7. Let's look more closely at this speech and break it down into its six stanzas. Generally, the six stanzas can be described as follows to provide us with an overall movement of the speech. In stanza 1, verses 1 to 4, the Father begins with a propositional statement. If you accept my words and store up my commands within you. This proposal, if accepted by the Son, receives two resulting conclusions that are expanded in the next two stanzas. Stanza 2, verses 5 to 8, gives the first result of the Son accepting His Father's words. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This reference to the fear of the Lord reminds us of the opening motto of the book of Proverbs in chapter 1, verse 7. Stanza 3, verses 9 to 11, gives the second result of the son accepting his father's words and commands. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good work. Wisdom is necessary to have the ability to discern or see the difference between good and evil. Foolish people cannot always see the traps and deceptions of the wicked. Once wisdom enters his heart, as the father says it will, then she will protect and save the son from two evils described in stanzas 4 and 5. In stanza 4, verses 12 to 15, wisdom will save you from the ways of the wicked men. These wicked men could include the evil companions the father has already mentioned in his first speech. The father knows that every young man must choose carefully the kind of friends he walks with. They must be good friends. The father emphasizes to his son that wisdom will help him select good friends and avoid evil ones. The second evil that wisdom saves the young man from is found in stanza 5, verses 16 to 19. It, wisdom, will save you also from the adulteress. This is the first mention of the adulteress. She figures prominently in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. For the young man leaving home, sexual sins are especially tempting. The father reminds his son that wisdom will help him avoid this sexual trap that promises temporary physical pleasure but really brings eternal spiritual ruin. Stanza 6, verses 20 to 22, concludes with, Thus you will walk in the way of good men. The speech ends with a conclusion or summary statement showing the results of obtaining wisdom and contrasts the righteous or wise and the wicked. It is a typical summary statement for wisdom literature. The Hebrew characteristics of this summary statement include path or way, signifying a way of life, and the word inheritance, which to the Hebrew mind implies the young man's final destination. Six stanzas, balanced in a structure of four lines, four lines three, repeated actually makes two sets of three stanzas. Three becomes a literary construction theme for each of the stanzas as well. As we shall see, each stanza can be broken down into three descriptive characteristics for that stanza's topic. Let's look again briefly at each stanza. 
In stanza 1, verses 1 to 4, the father encourages his son to accept his words and store up his commands, but he expands his encouragement to seek wisdom in three ways, with each including a double action. He says to his son that he should seek wisdom by, one, turning his ear to wisdom and applying his heart to understanding, two, call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and three, look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. There are a few things I'd like to point out about this stanza. First, notice the double action of turning, applying, calling, crying, looking, and searching. Second, the father encourages his son to use different parts of his body to find wisdom. His list includes ears, heart, mouth, voice, and eyes. Searching may also include arms and legs. Third, the father teaches that wisdom does not just come to the son, but rather he'll have to seek her out. One does not become wise by just sitting around passively. Fourth, the father reminds his son of wisdom's value, comparing her to silver and hidden treasure. She is superior to both of them. In stanza 2, verses 5 to 8, the father directly connects the gaining of wisdom with gaining a relationship with God. He then outlines three blessings his son would gain by walking with God. They include, first, the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Second, the Lord gives victory and shields the upright and blameless. Third, the Lord guards and protects the way of the just and faithful. Let me underscore wisdom's direct connection to the fear of the Lord. This reminds us of chapter 1, verse 7, and the close connection Israel's wise men made between honoring God and gaining wisdom. Also, the father emphasizes a major theme for Proverbs. A wise man should seek God's favor because the Lord brings with him protection and victory in life. In stanza 3, verses 9 to 11, the father lists three blessings that wisdom provides once his son gains understanding of what is right and just. Wisdom will, first, allow the son to understand what is right, just, and fair, every good path or way of life. Second, wisdom will enter his heart and be pleasant. Third, she will protect and guard him. I should point out that both wisdom and God will provide the same thing to the Son. They will give understanding to discern what is right and wrong, the right way of life and wrong way. They will guard and protect the Son so that he pleasantly experiences a victorious life. Also, the Father says, these are the gifts awaiting his Son if he searches after wisdom and gains or obtains her. And the protection of wisdom is the pivotal idea between the hinge verses of 11 and 12, between the last line of stanza 3 and the first line of stanza 4, the two halves of the poem. In stanzas 4 and 5, the father expands on how wisdom will bring about protection for his son by listing two examples of the most common wickedness that his son would most likely encounter, wicked male companions and wicked female companions in the form of the adulteress. First, let's look at the wicked male companions. In stanza 4, verses 12 to 15, the father says wisdom will save his son from evil men. These wicked men are described in three ways. First, their ways and words are wicked and perverse. Second, they leave the straight path to walk in dark ways. And third, they delight in wrongdoing and the perverseness of evil. It is important for the father to point out that gaining a right relationship with God helps his son avoid the wickedness of evil men whose habits, speech, desires, values, and the way of life are perverted, twisted, and far from God and his blessings. In stanza 5, verses 16 to 19, the father moves from wicked men to wicked women. In this speech, she is called the adulteress. For Hebrew wise men, the adulteress is literally a woman who has strayed away from her marriage covenant. In case the son doesn't know what she looks like, the father describes her in three ways. First, she is a wayward wife with seductive words. Second, 
She has left her partner and ignored the covenant she made before God. And third, her house and path lead to death and the spirits of the dead. Let's note that the father adds a spiritual summary warning about the adulteress for his son. Those who go to the adulteress do not return or attain the path of life. The adulteress and all she embraces bring only death to her partners. Also, the father emphasizes the adulteress's broken relationship with God more than her physical beauty, seductive words, or illicit tempting behavior. The father is rightly putting the spiritual danger of her companionship above the physical, though both are destructive and harmful to his son. Finally, stanza 6, verses 20 to 22, brings the father's summation of his speech to his son. If his son accepts his words and stores up his commands in his heart, three results come. First, his son receives a promise that he will then walk in the ways of good men and keep to the path of the righteous. This promise is further clarified by the contrasting of the righteous and wicked in the last two descriptions of his speech. Second, the upright and blameless will live and remain in the land, a promise of inheritance. Third, the wicked will be cut off and torn from it, meaning the land, or a loss of inheritance. Though it is disguised a little in English, this speech is an intricately structured poem of 21 lines, consisting of six balanced stanzas each with three descriptions. The hinge verses, connected themes, extended argument to gain wisdom and her blessings, and the emphasis on the interconnectedness of wisdom and one's relationship with God underscore the truth in the phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In this second speech of the Father, we can see how those two components are interrelated and mutually draw the Son to the other. I want to push on and briefly cover the structure and content of speech 3. I will not go into as much detail as I did in speech 2. However, I feel it's important to give at least some instruction on the speeches as we seek to gain a better understanding of how the first nine chapters of Proverbs is arranged. Speech 3 of the father to his son is located in chapter 3, verses 1 to 35. The speech breaks down into three large sections in the following manner. Section 1 includes verses 1 to 12. This part of the father's speech follows a similar theme as speech 2 in that he encourages his son to develop his relationship with God and seek wisdom. The father teaches that the two of them together bring long life and prosperity, favor and a good name, a straight path or way of life, health and nourishment, riches and discipline, which is a sign of sonship for God. Let me add some technical points to this section of speech 3. For the first time in Proverbs, couplets appear. Couplets are four-line proverbial sayings. Most Proverbs are two lines, often designated by a single verse reference in our Bibles. Couplets, though, take four lines, or two Bible verses, to make their point. The majority of couplets in Proverbs are found in chapters 22 to 25. However, the first 12 verses of speech 3 make up six couplets. An unusual note about speech 3 is the repeated use of the sacred name of Yahweh, translated Lord in this section. The Lord is referred to nine times in this speech. This is an unusually high number of references to God, considering Proverbs is practical experience wisdom. I like verses 7 and 8 for an important question concerning wisdom. When does wisdom cease to be wisdom? The answer is, when you become wise in your own eyes. This is an important teaching for the father to his young son. All of us have either been teenagers or have experienced teenagers who suddenly become smarter than their parents or teachers or any other adult figure they know. Most parents can probably point to a time when their adolescent child quoted another adolescent like they were some supreme authority on a given subject. 
often conflicting the wise counsel of the parents. Any parent with teenagers can quickly grasp and appreciate the practical significance of the father's warning to his young son. A similar principle is found in chapter 26, verse 12, where the proverb says, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Since Proverbs usually illustrates a fool as unteachable, this leaves little hope for the man or son who sees himself as already wise. The father wants his son to avoid this arrogant pitfall. On a spiritual note, chapter 3, verses 9 to 10, is the only place in Proverbs where tithing is specifically praised. If you remember, I said in the introduction there is almost no mention of worship or sacrifice in the book. This is a positive mention of tithing. Other places where religious duties are mentioned include chapter 7, verse 14, chapter 15, verse 8, chapter 21, verse 3, and chapter 21, verse 27. Let me add one more insight. Perhaps chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 sounded familiar to you. They should. These verses are quoted in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. Within the Hebrew letter, as well as here, they frame a paradox. Rather than seeing discipline as a punishment, the son or student should see it as an act of love, because discipline reflects sonship. A parent disciplines his own children, not someone else's children. In Proverbs, sonship means relationship with God, which, according to speech too, means gaining wisdom. So the father teaches God's discipline should be accepted with gratitude because it is a sign of relationship. Section 2 includes verses 13 to 26. In this section, the father expands his teaching on the value of wisdom, the blessings wisdom brings, wisdom's divine usefulness, and wisdom's protection. The first part of this section, verse 13, begins with the word happy or blessed. It is similar in construction and brings to mind the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Proverbs often compares the value of wisdom to silver and gold and precious rubies. In fact, wisdom is more precious than any of them and should be sought after more than earthly treasures. Verse 17 adds a new blessing that we have not heard about before. Wisdom brings peace. This peace may be twofold peace with God, and with one's community. Verse 18 purposefully describes wisdom as a tree of life. This intentionality connects wisdom to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 verse 9. This connection is intended to exemplify the life and relationship that wisdom brings is like that shared by Adam and Eve with God in the Garden. This would have a great impact on the father's young Jewish son. The use of the word blessed at the end of verse 18 parallels its beginning use in verse 13, making an inclusio. Remember, I talked about inclusio in the previous lesson. Another couplet in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, speaks of wisdom's role in creation. In effect, God uses wisdom to create the world. This theme will be expanded further in wisdom speech in chapter 8, verses 22 to 31. Some scholars would argue in verse 21 that it begins a new speech because it has the familiar my son marker and the father's instruction to value and seek wisdom. It is tempting to cut here and start a new speech. However, I tend to keep it together with speech three because it introduces an additional concept of wisdom's protection. If the son adorns himself with wisdom, there will be no need to fear sudden disaster, snares, or the ruinous fate of the wicked. He may sleep in sweet peacefulness. The idea of wisdom worn as an ornament in verse 22 brings to mind riches the son may gain and wear. It should also mean a physical manifestation of wisdom. Others will be able to see the son as a wise man. Section 3 of the Father's Speech includes verses 27 to 35. This section ends the Father's speech with five prohibitions, commandments that begin with the words, Do not. They are written in admonition form, verses 27 to 31, followed by a summary statement, verse 32, describing the difference between the righteous and the wicked and three spiritual contrasts between them, verses 33 to 35. 
Some technical points from this final part of the speech include the following. All five prohibitions speak of relationships with neighbors, especially in acts of kindness and justice. These prohibitions are intended to promote community well-being. If the son seeks relationship with God, then his relationship with others will change as well. This will allow the son to receive God's blessings and avoid judgment. Additionally, it lays a parallel foundation as that of Jesus' two greatest commands, love God and love your neighbor. What the Lord hates, detests, is identified as a perverse man, verse 32. This term of hate, detest, represents the strongest negative emotional response of God and is most often reserved for the wicked in their actions. In this final section, we learn that God's curse and blessings are given out according to one's conduct, verses 33 to 35. Without doubt, the Father's speeches uphold wisdom to be of greatest value. She is the bearer of blessings, riches, peace, honor, security, and a good reputation. Gaining true wisdom, not worldly wisdom, also brings the most important benefit, a relationship with God. Thus, seeking God's wisdom brings physical and spiritual benefits for the Son. This teaching has eternal significance. Thank you for listening to this lesson. I pray you've learned something new about speeches 2 and 3 in Proverbs. In lesson 5, we will continue our study of the Father's speeches in Proverbs 1 to 9. May you grow in wisdom. Until next time.